all right so today's topics are uh, i would i would say like they're neither from supervised learning nor from unsupervised learning altogether it's a mixture of both and like more specifically speaking we will be talking about uh, information retrieval techniques okay so both like the association rule learning and recommender systems they are part of uh, this larger uh, information retrieval they are like information retrieval systems specifically recommender systems and that topic in itself is so vast that it cannot be covered in a topics course like this i think it like needs a, a course in itself and and yeah but i try to cover like the like the more popular algorithms the more popular models and there is so much research going on right now in recommender systems that this this field is like a very uh, active area of research and i can point you to resources if you're interested uh, but regardless we'll try to cover what's important and the rest of the topics are based off of like these topics okay as i said this is around in, uh, information retrieval and information retrieval is important for platforms like amazon or platforms like netflix because what they're doing is they're offering items or movies to users to you and me and then they're trying to find some kind of association between the user and the items so that they can recommend better so that i buy more and so that i watch more movies and also like if we talk about recommender systems in specific they're trying to tailor the recommendation of movies or the recommendation of items that i see so that i buy more so that impacts their revenue in some ways so both like and like specifically recommender systems are an extremely important part uh, of any online platform be it retail uh, be it subscription pl based platforms or anything else um, and in addition to what recommender systems do like recommending items to users they also capture other relevant information that can be utilized for other things uh, specifically advertising pro promotional events and so on so that's why this this topic in itself is so important for any online uh, platform all right so first i wanted to begin with association rule learning and I, as I said, both association rule learning or sometimes also known as association rule mining is otherwise a larger topic. And now, like recently, deep learning has been used in conjunction with these topics. So for example, recommender systems are no more just like the collaborative filtering that we'll talk about, but it's more than that. But basically, we try to uncover relationship between users and items and items and items and users and users to make the experience for the user on any online platform better, okay? So now this like maybe relatively, this is a more recent concept given that now we have more data and we can utilize that data better uh, because everybody is online and everybody is on like almost every platform. So these platforms have uh, enough data to exploit that and make better use of that. But believe it or not, like even before like the advent of internet and even before the advent of like recommender systems, retailers were using some information from like their uh, transactions that were happening in any retail outlet to uncover some kind of a relationship between items and users and assortments in general. So that's where association rule learning came from. So basically this association rule learning, it's a rule-based mach machine learning method where we are trying to discover some relationship between items. Okay, so I'll give you some like very well-known examples specifically in data science, uh, where this was found like in many retailers and many retail outlets, uh, that if the, the sales of diapers, like the baby diapers, is related to the sale of beer, believe it or not. And so both those items go together. And so the way they kind of make their layout or the way they present the assortment to the customers is that they usually try to keep diapers next to beer because that's how that, that was the relationship that they uncovered. Whenever like diapers are bought, a beer is bought as well. So that's a rule. And so they can exploit that rule to better like advertise things or maybe like use promotions and, and other things, right? So assortment optimization in itself is a, a huge like area of research. And what we do in assortment optimization is we, we try to find those optimal assortments that can that should be placed on the shelves so that it like uh, facilitates more buying and hence more revenue. 
that's where the idea of association rule learning comes from. It's very uh, like interesting that these like relationships do exist and they do, and they've been found to boost the revenue as well, whether like believe it or not. So when, as I said, when customers, they buy something, there is some underlying pattern to the way they, they shop. And this underlying pattern is related to every individual. Like maybe I have a certain buying pattern when I make a list, I always like buy these certain items. Or sometimes like you have another, like everybody has their own pattern of like, if they go to a grocery store, what all things are they going to pick up? And the good thing is like on any online platform, that's easier to capture. That's easier to capture rather than like, uh, if you think of a, an actual like physical store, we are trying to do some kind of an aggregate sort of study based on the transactions and then coming with the relationships. So let's actually try to figure out what these relationships are and are, are there any metrics to kind of measure that relationship or not? And so, yes, there is. So for example, uh, and, and like what exactly are these relationships? So some of the relationships are like, for example, if we know that items X and Y are frequently bought together, so then the question arises, why is this useful to us? Well, it can be useful because X and Y can be placed on the same shelf. And then we know that like if the person, if somebody buys X, they're going to buy Y and so I can boost my sales, right? Or I can give promotional discounts to one of them because I know that like item X will be bought along with Y. So if somebody comes to buy Y and then I've, I like have, have placed some uh, promotional um, discount on Y, what I'll do is I'll facilitate like the, the sale of Y and then the sale of X would obviously be related to that. So then X will also be sold. So that way, and then advertisements could be like placed on either one of them because like if somebody picks one, the other one would most likely be picked. Okay, so as I said, association rule mining in general or association rule analysis, it's a technique to uncover how one item is related to another. Okay, so how do we do that? Like, how do I figure that this item is related to this item? So there are some measures, like some definitions or some metrics that are used to establish those relationship between items. Okay, so I'm gonna go over like the three most commonly used metrics uh, that are used to establish relationship between X and Y. And what we're trying to do with these is that like once we have found a relationship between item X and Y, we come up with some rule. For example, the first one, the first one is uh, known as uh, support, right? So what is support of an item? Well, let me quickly show you what I'm talking about because there are a few definitions that we'll be using again and again. So this is a, a basic uh, example. Let's, let's assume that this is like a transaction, um, the header of a transaction file, right? And so these are like transaction IDs, like one, two, three, four, five. And these are item sets. If you look on the right hand side, these are item sets. So that means in the very first transaction, uh, bread and milk was bought. And then the second one, bread, diapers, beer, eggs was bought and so on, right? So in association rule mining or in association rule analysis, I'm trying to figure out, is there a relationship between the items that are bought within a set? Because if there is a relationship there, then maybe I can place these items in such a way that like I can boost my revenue. I can facilitate the, the um, sale of one of them because the like that one is bought because of the other one, right? So how do we do that? So well, we base our like analysis on these three definitions. The very first one is known as support. So how do we compute support? Well, first of all, the idea of support says that we want to find out how popular a given item set is or an item is. So what is an item set? Like a, a, a unique set of items, that's all it is. And support will measure like the, uh, how popular an item set is based on the, the list of transactions that happen within a time period. So most, most likely like in a day or like you decide like in a week, the retailer decides essentially, right? So let's say I decided this is all the list of my transactions. And I want to find out the support for, let's say, bread and milk, right? So that's an item set, bread and milk. So basically, as I said, support is like how popular this item set is. And the way we compute the popularity is given by this here. And like, as I said, we are basically trying to figure out these rules. And usually you write a rule in this form, like X pointing to Y. 
So basically this means that this is an implication of some form in the sense that X is related to Y in some sense, right? And the way X is related to Y is in terms of support, confidence and lift. So we're gonna to come to support, uh, confidence and lift, but let's focus on like computing or calculating the support uh, of uh, bread and milk item set, right? So as I see bread and milk appears here, that's like one, right? And then uh, bread and milk appears here, and then bread and milk appears here, right? And let's say the total number of transactions in that time period was just five, okay? So then my support is just going to be three over five. Okay, so that's my support percentage. And in some sense, like my support for this item set is 60%. Now, how is this useful? It's useful because Usually retailers, based on their like historical uh, transactions, they create some threshold um, support value. So if I create a threshold support value, and then what my idea is that this this uh, like my, this support, let's say, was above that threshold value. So yes, this like item set is a support item. That means like the the items within that set they support each other. So then I have to like come up with a rule that they should be clubbed together or they should be placed together in a, in a shelf or placed next to one another. So that's what the support uh, is telling us. Okay, so that's the first one. The second one is confidence and confidence is defined in the sense, again, like I'm coming, with, coming up uh, with a rule for like one item to another. Right, so how so in this one, what I'm trying to say is like, how likely is item Y to be purchased when item X is bought or purchased? Right, so I'm trying to come with a like a rule. So basically, this like if you see this kind of a notation, that's what it says. Like X sort of implies Y, meaning that if like um, X is purchased, what is the probability or what is it? What are the chances? What is the likelihood that Y will be purchased? Right. And so this is just like the measure of like proportion of transactions with item X in which Y also appears. So let me just like do it for, let's say, okay, because I, I like we started with the example of di diapers to bear. So let's do that one. Right. Okay. So I'm trying to find the confidence of this rule. And my rule is that whenever diapers are bought, that implies that beer will be bought. Right? It's a very well-known example in data science, by the way. And this is usually a high confidence in like any retailer transaction data set. Uh, but for our uh, like data set that's given to us, the way we compute confidence, as you can see, is this thing. And actually, the formula for confidence that's used is the support uh, for both of them, like diaper and beer coming together. divided by the support of a uh, diaper alone. Okay, so think about this as like X implying Y, right? And so the way we compute or calculate confidence is I will find the support of this item set, which is like diaper and beer uh, together, which is nothing, uh, now if you remember from our definition of uh, support, it was just like the frequency of these item sets coming together. And so here I'll calculate the frequency of this one and the frequency of this, okay? So basically it's telling us that this is the total number of transactions where this item appeared. And this is the total number of transactions where both of them appeared together, right? So that's why we write it like this. And in this data set, it's going to be three out of four. Uh, let's see, one here and plus three, and then diapers are like four. Right? So that's why it's three over four, like in some ways calculating the frequency. So this is uh, confidence. And if we can figure out high confidence item sets, right? Then this like this rule holds that X implies Y. And then I can place X and Y together. Right? So let's say I have like some basic threshold of my confidence level. Let's say I decided it should be 75% at least. Or let's say I decided my threshold should be like 70% uh, at least for the confidence level for any item set, right? So there is this like threshold that we keep. And then if like the confidence of any item set is above that threshold, for example, in this case, it's like 75%. So then I'll say, yes, this is a high confidence item set. We should place them together, right? So that's a rule that I just uh, figured from the transactions data set. 
Okay. One issue with this confidence uh, metric um, could be that what happens if, like, I found that this is like a 75% um, confidence, but what happens if beer in itself was a popular item? And it's not really because of the diapers that the beer was bought, right? It was anyways a high confidence item or like it had, like, it, on its own, it had a higher support. So then this is not really giving me the relationship between X, when X is bought, Y is bought, Y is anyways bought, right? So in order to deal with that, uh, because like confidence sometimes uh, miscalculates this relationship between X and Y. And so therefore we come up with something that's known as lift. And this is, this here is lift. So that kind of gets rid of like what uh, confidence, like the negative side of confidence or the drawback of confidence. So basically what Lyft says is like how likely uh, item Y is purchased, that means beer is purchased, when X is purchased while controlling the popularity of that item in itself. So while I control the popularity of beer, I just want to know if X actually is like when X is bought, then Y is bought or not. Because that's what I want to do, right? So for that, what we do is we calculate something like this. And let me write it down. Like... Yeah, so like this is uh, the support of X and Y taken together divided by the support of X times the support of Y, right? So basically the frequency of diapers and beer bought together divided by the frequency when only diapers were bought and the frequency when only a beer was bought. Because then I can in some ways control the fact that this was this is a popular item. Right? So how does like how do we uh, know that like x implies y or not in, in our case like with our transaction? So let's actually calculate the lift and see what is it exactly telling us, right? So in this case, uh, okay, uh, lift, and I'm trying to find uh, the lift between these two. Okay. All right, so first I need the support of these two. So the support meaning the frequency of these two, right? So that's what? Uh, one, two, three, right? Just three? Yep. And then just only the diaper, uh, one, two, three, four, times, uh, what else? One, two, three, right? Right? So basically you're going to get a fraction, right? And that fraction implies something. So the fraction, like what we have to check is that whether the fraction is greater than one or is it less than one? So if this fraction is greater than one, that means my like item Y is likely to, to be bought with, with X. If it's not, then like if it's less than one, then the this item is not, was not a result of this uh, X, but it was anyways like a higher frequency item. That's why my ratio would like drop to a lower value, right? So that's what Lyft is telling us. And that actually deals with the, the drawback of confidence, right? So there are these three metrics that are used to come up with these basic rules between items. And this helps us uh, come up with like more optimal assortments, better assortments so that we can boost revenue, right? Yes. No, because that's like, yeah, because like th there's also this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it can be like both and uh, like quickly going to something here. I think this post actually gives us a very nice example of like uh, transactions. And this is like calculating the support, right? And here is the confidence and here is the lift. So for example, like going back to your question, if I'm calculating the lift, whether Apple uh, meant uh, buying more beer or not. So then I'm going to compute this, the support of Apple and beer together. So the support of Apple and beer together was I think calculated somewhere here which is four by eight. And then I will calculate the support of Apple and beer separately. And then I'll find this. And then I'll see whether the ratio is greater than one or less than. 
right? So this is a nice example. And they also show like in R how to implement this, but there are libraries in Python as well where you can implement the association rule uh, and calculate these values for bigger transaction data sets. Obviously what we are looking at is like a very basic or a small uh, data set, but then like going ahead and, and calculating these with a, for a larger data set would make more sense. Okay, there are negatives to this type of learning and we'll look at like what those are. Uh, but yeah, this is like a very basic way of uh, coming up with some relationship between items. Okay, and then you can even like uh, come up with your own rules, right? You can even come up with your own rules of like one or like a, a complete set of items related to just one item. When this set of items is bought, this is always bought. So that's another level and you can go to this uh, article and see how that is done. For example, if I remember there's a, uh, uh, so like a, a known item set that's like onions and potatoes if they're bought together then ketchup is always bought so like that's there it's a, it's a very known well-known relationship so those kind of things like an item set related to an item or like an item related to an item set so all those can be done as well okay so association rules are usually used to satisfy a user specified minimum support meaning like you set a threshold because it depends on your business and uh, what kind of a retail store you have. And depending on that, you have to specify that. And then association rules uh, are generally split up into two separate steps. Uh, you have to have a minimum support threshold and it's, it should be applied to find all frequent item sets in a database. Right, because then you can create the, the association between them. So you'll have to find the support first for all possible item sets. But then there is, and, and then, yeah, of course, a minimum confident constraint, confidence constraint should be applied to these frequent item sets because I have this percentage of confidence on this item set. But there is an issue, there's a huge issue with this like step one in itself. And that issue is, let's say I have like 1 million items in my catalog or something, or maybe I have like a huge number of items even in my store. Then if I'm like trying to find the support for every item set, then you can imagine like how many items, like two to the n, right? And this is like an impossible problem to solve. So how do we deal with that? So, well, we have uh, some algorithms and we're gonna talk about like one of them. So the size of this, this is known as the power set. You must have come across that, right? So it grows exponentially in the number of items, but an efficient search is possible. And like, there are proofs of how we can efficiently search like those item sets. And the high level idea is that if there is an item that is in itself not very frequent, most likely it will not make it to the frequent uh, item sets anyway. Anyways, so that item can be eliminated if we just calculate the, the standalone support of that item. Right? Let me repeat it. Let's say I had some item, uh, for example, here. Let's say, uh, Okay, cola is a very infrequent item. So I can calculate, like I know the number of items that I have in my catalog, and I know that this one is, I can calculate the support of only this one, right? Then I don't need to calculate all the item sets that include, includes cola, because that item set will be infrequent as well. And like it, can, it is like mathematically shown in many papers that this is the case. And so once I have calculated the, the support for all the items individually, I can just like discard a lot of them because they had a, a smaller support value and smaller than my decided threshold. And so I just like get rid of those. And so I don't have to uh, uh, like calculate all those item sets and then uh, calculate the confidence, right? So I'm gonna show you like a very nice uh, demonstration, but this is the idea behind a priori algorithm. You must have seen that, so association rule learning is actually uh, done using that algorithm. There are more sophisticated algorithms out right now, but they're based on this fundamental idea. That the, you can eliminate a lot of items so you don't have to worry about them. And then this, this search becomes faster, at, like faster than what we thought it would be, right? So yeah, so that's why like the, here is this example that means if a bear was found to be infrequent, we can expect that bear and pizza would be more infrequent. And so we'll not include that set in, in our search. Okay. okay, so here are like the list of uh, steps. Start with the item sets containing just a single item, right? For every item that we'll have to do at least, and then just like get rid of the infrequent ones. And then we'll determine the support 
keep the item sets that meet my minimum threshold and get rid of the rest. And then using these item sets, I'll keep generating my other item sets until like I, I can. And then I'll keep in every step, I'll also keep discarding the ones that fall below my threshold. So then that's a very efficient way of like searching, right? So let me show you what, what this is like doing. And this is just like a, so this apple was found to be infrequent, so I just removed it. And then I created item sets from like other items, right? And then I, based on their support, so like basically this red area is showing that these were the ones that I didn't have to look into, right? So that made it like really efficient, right? Okay, yeah, that's a nice, uh, I don't know, animation. I always like to look at it like when that red part appears and yeah. Okay, so that demonstrates like what the a priori algorithm does. There, uh, okay. Yeah, and then keep repeating when until there. So I, I think we, we understand what this means. Uh, okay. Finding item rules with high confidence. So obviously, as I said, this is based on, usually it's based on like your previous experience, your previous transaction and the data that you have. So you have to come up with your own um, confidence, your threshold. And this is also sometimes um, calculated from your like data and from your like transaction data that you have, right? So finding rules with high confidence or lift is less computationally taxing once high support items have been identified. We just saw, right, why? Uh, because confidence and lift values are calculated using the support value. So if I have like the support values and I'm like, most likely done. So it totally depends on like how you are trying to uncover the relationship between items. And depending on that, I can decide for my business whether I'm looking at the lift of the items, whether I'm looking at the confidence, or whether I'm just like looking at the support, right? But usually lift is, is calculated because it's a more sort of robust measure of uh, creating these rules. All right. Uh, any questions, doubts before we move on? Okay, the a priori algorithm is easy to understand, right? You're just like getting rid of uh, low support items, that's it. Okay, some drawbacks, obviously computationally expensive, takes time, although it reduces the number of candidate item sets, but when like the number is huge, maybe it might not have that much use, like it's not that useful because you still have a large amount of data to process and so on. And then you're not done with the support. Usually people will go and calculate the lift because that gives a more robust measure of like the relationships. And that could be complex in itself. And then what like the example that we looked at here was a very basic type of example where I was just like looking at one item to another. But also imagine when I'm looking at like one item set to another item set or one item set to one item or one item to another item set. So that's like a lot there, right? So it is like computationally expensive. That's like the first drawback. And then sometimes, uh, because we have like a lot of data and a lot of items, sometimes you can, um, like large number of items can lead to like these uh, associations that weren't necessarily there or like they weren't as important and they don't impact your revenue as much. So like there is that downside as well to it, right? Okay, so those, Two other drawbacks. I just mentioned the uh, ECLAT algorithm, which actually builds on the a priori algorithm. So that's also there. So if you remember this one, this this link, the animation, what we are doing is more like a breadth first search type of a, uh, an approach, right? So what we're doing is like we are going through all the items and then like, so there's a three base structure. What this eclat will do is it makes that a priori search a little faster by doing a depth first search instead of like a breadth first search. So that's a fundamental difference and it just like makes it faster. I decided not to go into the like too much detail of this one. So this is, uh, it's like, um, it's a very well-known algorithm. If you want to go into the details of that, like how exactly is it doing the depth first search, you can go and check. In fact, as far as I remember in Python and in TensorFlow, you have a package using which you can implement this as well. But regardless, it is doing the same search, getting the, the high support item sets. The only way it's searching is different, like the uh, the way a priori is searching is different from the way this is searching, but both, both of them are doing exactly the same. Okay, so this was 
about association rule mining or association rule learning. Of course, there's more to this, and this is nowadays used in conjunction with uh, more sophisticated deep learning algorithms because we have so much data around. And when we talk about items in retail and online retail, there is no way we can miss recommender systems. So I decided to talk a little bit about recommender systems, although they have been appearing on and off in our discussions. But today I just wanted to cover the like some of the basic techniques that are there. So that like we are aware that like this is what's uh, this is how recommender systems work, and this is like some of the the research areas or the the existing algorithms that that exist, and also because recommender systems has been my uh, research area, so that's why I don't want to miss that as well. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my research. Of course, it's more advanced than what we are covering in this class, but if you're at all you're interested, I can point you to a couple of my papers. Uh, but yeah, going back to the actual topic, recommender systems. So recommender systems or recommendation engines, they are used and they are in some ways like information retrieval systems so that they can expose the customers or the users to the right uh, items so that that can facilitate more buying, right? And there is another like goal of using these recommender systems. Uh, that and that is to get rid of something that's known as information overload. So there is so much information out there. If you just think about only Amazon, for example, right? So there are so many items, uh, but based on your user profile, based on your browsing history, Amazon recommends some items to you, right? Of course, you can go and search things, but in some ways, if you think about a recommender system, it is like a search algorithm, but you're not doing any explicit search. But that engine is searching something for you based on like whatever data it has about you, and then it's recommending things to you. And believe it or not, these are an, like an extremely important part of any platform's revenue, be it Netflix. And I'm sure you're familiar uh, familiar with the Netflix price in 2006, uh, where it, like I think a million uh, was one when like some of the ensemble techniques are used for recommending uh, movies. But for um, Netflix, it is an important part of their revenue, and so is the case with Amazon. So that's why they are very uh, important. And although they were like, when recommender systems were built, they were built on very simple rules of just like trying to find similarity between people or similarity between items, right? So that's how the idea came about. But now they, have, they use deep learning models and more complex systems. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, but regardless, I wanted to talk about the more basic models. And one thing to remember is that recommender system models can be categorized into two high level uh, models. So the first one is collaborative filtering and the second one is content based filtering, right? Collaborative filtering is more efficient. And so in most of the platforms that exist today, like specifically Amazon, they use collaborative filtering. Okay, so let's try to understand what is collaborative filtering and then we'll jump to the others. And within like collaborative filtering, there are like two types of algorithms. So let me just like, without making uh, making you people overwhelmed with like so much information, because the issue is that if I start talking about recommender systems, I have a lot to say. So I just want to like refrain from like saying too much. So yeah. Okay, so collaborative filtering is, as the name suggests, is based on the idea that there is some similarity between users, so we can exploit that. And like, if I'm like, if my profile or if my attributes, so to say, are very similar to those of yours, and then let's say you watched a movie, most likely I like that movie as well because I'm very similar to you in terms of my attributes, in terms of like uh, whatever information this uh, platform has of me, right? So that's what collaborative filtering does. It filters based on like, the similarity of users and items. Now there are two different like, so within collaborative filtering, there are two types of filtering methods. So one is model-based and the other is uh, memory-based. Okay, so within like memory-based, you will come up with item, item, uh, and this was like devised by Amazon itself, item, item, collaborative filtering, and then user, user collaborative filtering and so on. So like both, these are the primary ones, there are others as well. And within uh, model-based uh, algorithms, you have 
uh, matrix factorization uh, methods that are used to like uh, recommend items, right? So what we do is like here, we, we are looking at some hidden features in users and items, right? So I can say like latent models that are like mostly, mostly based on matrix factorization methods, right? So first, let's begin with the memory-based models. That's the item, item, and user, user. Uh, collaborative filtering. Both are essentially the same. Uh, here we are trying to find the relationship between users and users. Here we are trying to find the relationship between all items, right? So let's begin with like the user user collaborative filtering. So what we can do is let's say I have like this uh, data set of uh, users and users and then like movies, movie one, movie two and so on, let's say and movies. And some of the users have rated some of these movies, right? Uh, for, I don't know, zero. And like some of the movies were not rated, right? Some of the movies have like this missing uh, rating. So for example, like if this user comes in, right? And they have watched like some movies and rated some of them, right? But they haven't rated this one, right? And in my like algorithm, I was able to find that this UN, this new user, is very similar to U1, right? And now U1 has rated this like movie one pretty high. And these two are like very close to one another, right? And so most likely this user will also like this, right? And so I'm going to recommend this movie to this user. Okay. And for example, another one was missing here for this user, and this this one rated it like really low. And then because these users are so similar. I'm not going to recommend this movie to this user because most likely they'll also not like it, right? So now in item item uh, filtering, what happens is that instead of like using users as this like similarity base and then figuring out whether we should be um, recommending something or not, I am going to find the relationship between items, right? So what is the relationship between these movies? How similar are these? So based on that, if somebody has like, so I have this relationship between items, and based on if somebody, uh, if, if a new user comes in, and um, if like this kind of, uh, uh, if uh, like one of the ratings is missing and the other is there, and then based on like what they have liked themselves, right? Let's say they've liked this movie a lot, right? This new user, and I'm talking about now item item, right? And this, they, they like this M10 movie a lot. And I found in my item item similarity analysis, so this M10 is very similar to some M11 movie, right? And they haven't watched this one. So I'm going to recommend it because this M11 is very close to M10. And if it's like really far away, if this M11 was very far away from M10, most likely I'll not recommend it. So that's a fundamental idea. So what you're doing and why are they memory based? Because in both the cases, like step one, if you think about this user user, I'm going to come up with this like user uh, matrix, right? where I have like some similarity measure between every user. And so if I have like a million users, you can imagine the size of this matrix. And then I have to maintain it all the time. So that's why I have to keep that in memory somewhere and then refer to it whenever a new user comes in. So just like for one transaction, I have to go and jump into that. Of course, I have like efficient techniques to search that's, that's there, but still I'm maintaining that relationship. And then like as new users are coming in, my matrix is growing. And that like this can be sparse in many cases. It's hard to find relationships. Of course, like one basic um, way of finding relationship between users is like maybe finding a dot product or cosine similarity or maybe Euclidean distance. It, it depends on us. But still we are maintaining some kind of uh, like memory. And from that we are, uh, yeah, another question? Yes, yes. Yes, that's a lot. And, and that's why these, these techniques are known to be like not as efficient. And that's why we will come to model based uh, techniques. Yes. Yes, yes. So these are also that's a good point, actually. So these are also known as like neighborhood type methods. So like in order to make the search more efficient, we do that like we do cluster and keep them in those clusters and then that makes our search faster. But regardless, I still have to keep some kind of a 
um, like data and it's it's not like on the fly that's happening, right? It's like I have to maintain some kind of, a, um, I don't know, some attributes for those customers all the time. And yeah, that, that's what we do. Like the, the next, okay, what happened? Oh, just give me, my computer will just turn off. It's the issue with this one, it doesn't stay long. Okay. Yeah. So then going back to your question, we, we do uh, like uh, use techniques like clustering and other such like neighborhood based techniques where we keep some uh, like track of those kind of users. And so like if a new user comes in that fall, falls into that cluster and it's easier to instead of like searching the entire matrix. So of course that can be done. Yeah. Uh, but even after that, you know the size of Netflix, you know the size of Amazon, even with all those things happening, it's very difficult to keep like things in memory. Plus, we want these platforms to be faster. And there are issues like if a new user comes in, we don't have any information about that user. It's hard to find out the relationship of that user. With Let's say I just created an account on Amazon and I don't give them any of my information. I don't fill out that profile form or whatever, right? And so that's the cold start problem, which is like people are still dealing with it. Uh, on platforms like Twitter, for example, if I create an account today uh, and like Twitter doesn't know what, what I like because I never gave them any information. So it'll take some time for the platform to know what I like and what is who's that user that's close to me and so on. So there are those issues there, right? And cold start problem, by the way, is, a, is an ongoing, very hot topic for these types of platforms. One way of dealing with cold start problem is uh, usually uh, just go and recommend the most popular item. That's the thing. But then that's not a good solution. That's not a good solution, right? And there are other techniques that are coming up. I don't know if you remember when we were talking about reinforcement learning, there was, uh, there's a paper where they use this like reinforce, uh, reinforcement learning technique uh, to deal with cold start problem. But again, they, they did get good results, but not as, as good as we would like. And yeah, so those are some of the issues that are there with like these memory-based models. And so we move to the uh, latent models or and let me just quickly go back to the lecture notes and see if I uh, missed anything. Okay, so we talked about user similarity, user, user, collaborative filtering, item, item, uh, collaborative filtering. Uh, yeah, one good thing with item, item is I would uh, point that out here is that users are coming in more and so that's like every time a new user comes in, I have to calculate the similarity of that, that user, unknown user with another user. But with items, that's a little better. And that's why item item collaborative filtering is better than user user. Because of course, like new items are added, but not as much like on a platform like Amazon. And then I know everything about that product. If I add a product to my platform and selling things. So as a retailer, I know th like, what that item is, right? So I can like find it's like, how, what is that item? I know it, right? So I can calculate the the relationship between them. So that's like, in, in some ways it's it's like more efficient. So that's there and it's faster than user, user similarity uh, method. I have a quick like implementation of user, user, although I, I thought I'll also implement item, item, but I was like too lazy to, uh, going to do the entire process again, but I have like this movie lens data set and I've implemented this user user collaborative filtering for you. I would ask like, if you're interested in recommender systems at all, just like look at the code and try to implement the item item uh, um, collaborative filtering yourself. So there, like I have uh, done it like one step by step. So first I'm calculating the user user matrix, like their similarities, and then I'm doing the predictions, like which uh, user is nearest to me and then like, you can just like go ahead and, and check this. It's not that that much. And then I have a few comments that will help you understand what's going on. And if at all, like you're interested, as I said, just do an item-based collaborative filtering yourself. So that will make like you understand what's what goes on, right? So just like take this file, make a copy, and then just create another one from here. Uh, okay. Yeah, in terms of evaluation, we usually use mean squared error. Uh, uh, in, in my test set and see like how much off I was from the actual ratings of if, if we have some, because we'll have some predicted ratings. And then I can keep a test set where like the actual ratings can be compared to my uh, predicted ratings, right? So that's that's how we evaluate these. Okay. 
Yeah, so coming to our uh, model-based collaborative filtering methods, and these are sometimes also known as these latent factor modeling uh, techniques. Now, the basic idea here is that I have this matrix of like user and movies, and they have explicitly rated these movies, right? But then there is this underlying relationship that this movie is, let's say from, it's an action movie, and it has a particular actor, and maybe it's in a particular language. And so those factors are not taken into account when I'm just like using those ones and zeros or like five or three or whatever, like those explicit numbers. And I'm calculating the similarity, right? There, there are more like hidden features within those, those users and those um, movies. And so we are not 100% taking care of that by just using the memory-based methods. So what this like latent factor uh, methods or modeling, it says that there are these implicit features that we need, need to take into account. Because these are explicit features. So when you take ratings or uh, like explicitly given by the user, then those, those are known as explicit features. Now we are interested in implicit features. And so the way to get the implicit features is that this entire matrix, this user item matrix can be factorized into a lower dimensional set of matrices using decomposition techniques from mathematics, right? So for example, what does what singular value decomposition does? It like decomposes my matrix into two other uh, matrices. Uh, and I can do some kind of like approximation, like for example, rank one approximation tells me that this is the, and uh, okay, we haven't covered PCA as much, but if you're familiar with singular value decomposition or even uh, other types of decompositions, you might understand that we are actually going into a lower dimensional space. And then we are getting those matrices that have more information about the same um, space, but then we can utilize that to build better models. So that's exactly what's happening here. So maybe just like, uh, quickly writing down uh, what's going on here. Uh, let me write it down here. Okay. So what happens in singular value decomposition, if you remember, is that if let's say this is my um, user item matrix, right? So I can decompose it into like these this this form, and you have I'm sure maybe in your linear algebra other classes have seen this one, right? So what's happening is that this is like some a uh, way of uh, splitting this matrix of like user and items into like two uh, other parts. For example, if let's say my original, uh, I don't know how to say this. Let's say I have like M users and this is like my original uh, M users and N items, right? So what I can do is like, I can um, uh, use these explicit ratings and compute like some kind of like this form, like this is a high level, a better way of like understanding what's happening. So I can like um, break it down into these two matrices in some ways, right? So what will happen is like this one here, this form here, right, will represent some kind of user latent factors. Like for example, this user is um, in this geographic location, and so some, in some ways, like some features that are that are related to the to, to the uh, user, right? So that's what's happening here. For example, this one is going to be the user matrix where like if this was M by N, this could be like some M by K, and this one could be like some N by K. And this K here is like how many latent factors do we want? So this is more like a, a hyperparameter that we decide, right? That like by K, I want to split it into like these two matrices. And then if I multiply these, they would in some ways give me this one back. But this is in some ways like my estimated way of getting the user uh, latent factors and my item latent factors. So for example, think of think of the item or the movies as um, this will come up with some features of the movies. For example, this it belongs to this genre. So like all the movies that belong to that genre will have those values in that in that column. Right. And similarly, like these users are similar to one another. So they have like similar values in the rows. And then as I said, K is something that I can decide that this is how I want to split this. So these type of techniques help us uncover the like the implicit relationship between users and items. And there's a lot that has been done in this area. As I said, I'm splitting it into like K, where K is like some value which is less than both M and N. 
So it has to be less than the number of users because I split it up in such a way. And like if I multiply this, right, I will again get some, if, if this was, if this is denoted by R, let's say this was my original uh, user item matrix and I decomposed it into these two, right? Then basically when, when I think about this right hand side, and K was some hyperparameter. Let's say I decided I'll have 50 uh, latent factors, right? So I split it up into that size. And then I can write something like, this is my predicted for this one as something like this. Right, the right hand side is my predicted based on my K, I split it up into, into some um, values and those are my features for my user and my item. So now how do we train this? How do we train this? And then like, this was split up by using all these ratings that like explicitly users gave, right? Users gave some ratings and I utilize these to create these matrices, right? I use those only. So in some ways we also have to think about that different users rated these movies. And so there are biases within users as well, right? And we have to take care of that. For example, let's say I am like a more optimistic user and I just rate everything very high. And there are some people who just like, even if they like the movie too much, they'll just like rate it three, right? So those factors are also taken into account when we train our uh, model. So basically we rewrite this as something like uh, this part plus some bias, right? So we add some bias and let's say the estimated this, uh, these matrices for user U and item I is given by, and like, I'm just taking a row from this one, and a column from this one, a row from each one of them, and then just like writing it in this form, plus the bias for the user, plus the bias for the item. So like we include both both uh, both of them, and then what is like how does the training happens in these type of models? That's the question, right? Of course, I came up with this like predicted value and all that. So basically, we use mean squared error to train these models. So I have like this R predicted when I multiply them again right or when i combine them again and then i have the original r and so the difference between them is my error and based on that i'm going to train my model using any of the optimization um, algorithms that we know stochastic gradient descent adams whatever you want to do right so basically what the problem that we're trying to solve in this case is let me write it down is the man And usually in, uh, there is an issue of overfitting a lot in recommender systems. So we do add a regularization term, right? So with uh, the regularization added here, right? So this is what we are trying to minimize. This is my um, objective function. And these, like these R's, they include the biases for the users and the items. Usually for the user is an important one. And that's what we need, right? So then as I said, parameters are learned using any of the optimization algorithms that we are already uh, aware of or familiar with. Now this one, the model-based uh, learning in recommender systems is a more common way of training or learning in recommender systems because we are eventually coming up with these like lower level level late factors or like the features for both users and items, which wasn't the case in our memory-based models when we were explicitly taking the ratings and just like doing a dot product or a cosine similarity. Right, we we could actually because if you think about singular value decomposition and like PCA, if you're familiar with PCA, right, we come up like for example for the uh, the very first principal component, it's like rank one approximation, right? So like the maximum variability is is explained by the first principal component and so on, right? So those are what like if you think about them, those are some features that were that are extracted from my original matrix, and that's what we are making use of there. Okay, so that's that. I know this is like in general a hard uh, sort of idea to understand. And I do have an implementation which I tried. Yeah, I did try that. And, and like just for you to go and like check this, so there's like my notebook. I wanted to add more to this, but just like ran out of time. Again, I'm using the movie lens data and I've tried to break it down into like steps as much as I can. But anyways, I'm not like, I haven't implemented anything myself. I'm just using, uh, I think I'm using, like, which package am I using? Yeah, this this thing is enough, I think, to to calculate the 
uh, decomposition here. Like just two lines of code actually. Just use SciPy uh, uh, this this particular module SVDS. So that that's that does it for you. That's it. This K like this is this is good. Like this this is worth like. Uh, checking based on like the value of k, you can see how much like your prediction error varies, right? So playing with that can help. But usually people try to keep k between 20 to 50. But with movie lens, I've seen like it works well, like if you're using 50, try try changing it and see what happens, right? So this is like something that you can try. Okay, where is it? Uh, this one. Yeah, this was about the Netflix uh, prize, if you're interested in that one. So basically, this uh, the matrix factorization techniques came from here. The one that won the prize was built on matrix factorization in conjunction with other ensemble like tree-based techniques as well. So that's a worth like that's worth reading at least, just going over like how this was done. Okay, and then as expected, we uh, like, first of all, did we talk about content-based filtering? We didn't talk about content-based filtering, right? Yes, go ahead. Yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah, that's that's there, but I don't think we go that far. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, that. Yes, yes, yes. No, that's a that's a valid uh, issue actually there, but yeah, we we're not going uh, that that ahead. Like, if you, I don't know how to say this, but this is like a, a, a like a research, a very active research area that like how can we make these uh, systems better uh, because like sparsity is an issue and yeah so that's that's there okay coming to content based filtering i just skipped this for some reason i didn't see so this is more like you're finding the like relationship between a user and items and so imagine that the user and the item are in the same space and so how close that user is to a particular item that way Right. So, uh, for example, let me just quickly show you a very basic sort of idea of what's going on. So, again, in content-based filtering, I have like some items, like let's say item one, item two, and there are some attributes of the item. For example, let's say these items are some like I don't know news posts, right? And then like, are they too political, right? Or is it like about travel and other like attributes, right? And then we can like come up with for every item we can come up with like where it lies right so yeah it was a bit like on a scale of zero to five yeah it was political uh, on a scale of zero to one it was it about travel no and so on right so i can come up with this item as well and so on right now if the user comes in and i want to recommend a post to the user based on their like previous data that i have for the user i should have created a profile for the user for this one and based on that profile i can check how much political, uh, like politically inclined this user is, like maybe on a scale of, on the same scale, it's like zero to five, uh, it's four. And are they interested in travel? Uh, okay, two and so on, right? And then what you do is like, you find the similarity of this user with every item that you have based on these attributes. So maybe like one very simple way of thinking is let's, let's say I find the dot product with every item. And then the one that has the maximum dot product, I'm going to recommend that, item to this user, right? So, but like collaborative filtering techniques came after this because this was a pretty slow method for every user. I'm going into the entire item set and then calculating the dot product, like although it's very simple or cosine similarity, but then I'm doing it for every user, right? And so that's like a very, um, I would say inefficient way of like recommending, but that's there. And the like content-based filtering systems existed before collaborative filtering came in and then uh, matrix factorization methods came in. With matrix factorization, actually, um, things have become really faster, and now we'll see how in deep learning uh, when we apply deep learning as well. So going down, 
Okay, yeah, here I just wanted to like figure out, uh, point out that recommendation tasks are not just like limited to like uh, predicting the ratings only, uh, but there are other things that are involved. For example, this issue of like learning to rank is another problem, which is slightly different from this one. And so there are like, there's a separate area of research that goes into like learning to rank. Um, for example, if you go on like a feed based platform, like maybe Facebook or Instagram, so there's a feed that that's coming in, right? And the way uh, the, the posts are ranked, like in what order will you see the posts is another like important problem that is dealt with by recommender systems. So it's not just like collab collaborative filtering or content based filtering where you're just like recommending one item here. It's like what are the top 10 items for this user and in what order should they be uh, provided to you? So that's another like whole another area of like recommender systems. That's a one problem. And then based on, we already talked about implicit and explicit feedback type um, methods, right? So in like, for example, matrix factorization, we came up with this idea of like getting those implicit um, features of users and items and then using them to make the system learn, right? And then we can do explicit feedback like actual ratings or actual ranking. So all of that is there, but yeah, just like to keep in mind, whenever you're solving a recommender system problem, know what problem are you solving, right? So going back to like the, the research um, that I'm interested in is that there is this, uh, okay, so let me just like jump into that quickly to give you an idea of what I do. Um, on platforms like Netflix and Amazon, you have an unlimited number of items, right? And I'm trying to, with these techniques, recommender system techniques, I'm trying to find, okay, this user likes this, and so I'm gonna recommend this, or maybe this is a top end item that I'm going to give them, right? But there is this like issue that if, let's say I'm the user, and Netflix shows me 10 movies, and then Netflix shows me 20 movies, is there a difference between those two in the way I'm going to select something? Because for Netflix, it's really it really matters that I select something. So if they're showing me this like unlimited number of items, right? Is there an impact of the number of items to my selection or rejection? Right. So that's the the thing that I've been working on. And so I'm seeing there is like this optimal assortment size for every user, and we can extract that using user data, and we can predict the probability of their preference depending on the assortment size. So you can predict, like if, if you give me 10 items, the probability of me selecting item A is different versus like if that, that item was offered in an assortment of size 20 or 25, right? So the, the idea of information overload. And so yeah, so that's something that I do and let me not like overwhelm you with more, but like I just gave you a high level idea of like uh, my research. Coming back to what like the rest of the world is doing <laughs> is deep learning in recommender systems. So you understand collaborative filtering, you know, matrix factorization techniques. So think of this as like in matrix factorization, I uncovered the implicit um, features of users and I uncovered implicit features of items. And then I use those as embeddings, right? So I use that information, those vectors as input to my neural network. And then the rest of this, the stuff stays the same. You have a feed forward network. You just feed into that, these embeddings, this information, this user item information, right? So that's like what's happening here, right? Uh, user latent vector that we found from my factorization techniques because that's a better representation of my user, right? And then item latent vector, again, from matrix factorization, I got the second, remember the second matrix when I factorize them? And then I'm using that to input to my feed forward network, right? And then like, you can do a lot of like things here, like what do you want to predict the probability? Do you want to predict the exact rating and so on? That depends on like how we figure like the layers and how do we want to have the con configuration. But this is a high level idea of how deep learning has been used with in recommender systems. And in fact, most of the recommender systems now on like whether be it Amazon or even on Google, have been using this kind of a model, but with an exception here. So, yeah. So there is a there is this thing called wide and deep. So these are this is a deep network, and I'm feeding the user latent vector and the item latent vector, and then making the system predict something. But what I can do is I can combine such like many such networks 
And then based on like different uh, user and item information at, at different times, I can combine those like wide, meaning like I have multiple parallel networks running together. So that's what a wide and deep network does actually. And that's that was devised by Google as expected, makes things very complex and they'll eventually work really well. But that's like just a joke, but it's like a very powerful network to be honest. And it has like very good um, results. So I have a paper, I think, that actually shows us that, yeah, so this, so the recommender system problem that they're solving here is the CTR prediction, click through rate prediction, how many times the user clicked uh, and the number of posts they saw. So that uh, frequency or that ratio is the click through rate. And I think they had a very nice, uh, yeah, this one here. So this actually shows the kind of, uh, this is the architecture of that model, the wide and deep model. And what's happening is like there are multiple networks that are obviously connected to one another. And uh, yeah, let's not <laughs> like go deeper into that because it's like pretty complex, but you understand the idea of like what's happening. And the basis for all these is that you have uh, like the user and item information and you, you use that to feed into the network and it can uncover more nonlinear relationships between like items and users. That's the idea because obviously that's what like a neural networks model, right? The non-linearity between users and items. Uh, all right, so I think that's all I have, but I quickly wanted to go over. I think this one is about association rule mining. This is an old paper, but this, this is the one that came up with like the idea of their relationship between items and we can exploit that and increase our revenue. So this is like a one that's worth reading. And this one, I don't remember which one this was. Yeah, so this actually explains later fact, latent factor models for recommendations. And this also, I think, talks about your like question, going back to your question, the um, sparsity in, in like matrices and how to deal with them uh, when we are using this like factorization. So this is also worth a read if you're interested. Uh, all right, so that's all I have for today's lecture. My recommendation at the end, because we were talking about like recommender systems, is please go over these implementations that I have and like try to play with them, try to like tweak them a little bit and try to implement the item item uh, similarity, uh, sorry, item based collaborative filtering yourself. It's just like take the user based uh, collaborative filtering and just re implement that with the items, right? And see what happens and whether it gives better results or not. So, yeah, that's all I have for today's lecture. If you have questions, please go ahead. Otherwise, yeah, that's that's it. Thank you.